Ashley? Um, yeah, yeah, very great. There he is. Come um, on, guys. We gotta go. Do you want to go first? I'm just going to do an overview. You can go next, then Ed, then Ashley, then I don't care how we do it. Good afternoon, and, and thanks for, for being here. Uh, the group you see before you today has come together uh, for two reasons, really. One is to uh, object to the governor's proposal for a 900-plus bed mega prison uh, complex. But a lot of people are complaining about that, actually. Um, what we're really here to do is to say, okay, so we're all against this. What are we for? What should we be doing instead? Um, we all know that there, ha there is work to be done with some of our facilities. Uh, they need to be upgraded. We need to do something with, uh, with the uh, adolescence facility. We need to do something in the way of a, foren a small forensic facility for mental health patients. Those things need to be done. They certainly, by the way, do not need to be done uh, by an out-of-state uh, corporation. We're, we're very firm on that. But what we really want to focus on is what we should be doing instead uh, to support people who have been incarcerated for a variety of reasons, bring them back into society, uh, help them with rehabilitation and jobs and training, and in fact, in many cases, to do some prevention, but also to address the systemic issues that, that cause uh, the uh, amount of incarceration that we see in this state, uh, including systemic racism, which we have to grapple with. Um, but also, as I said, we need to find other ways to get people out successfully into the community. Uh, so you're gonna hear uh, this afternoon briefly from several people who have much more direct interaction or uh, experience with the corrections and incarceration system to, to touch on some of the issues. But what our coalition in the end is asking for is that the legislature create a commission, not a study group, not some flash in the pan, take a look at it, but a commission that will actually comprehensively address the issues that lead to the incarceration pro problems that we have in this state. Uh, and that that commission um, could last even longer than one year. It could last for a while because the, the, the issues we're dealing with are extremely complex, uh, and there are many of them. And so that's, that's what we're asking for, is to get to all these issues. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to some other people uh, and let them tell you their perspective on the issue and the, and the uh, work that needs to be done to address it. Mark? Thank you, Patrick. My name is Mark Hughes. I am with the, um, a, a racial justice group called Justice for All, which I'm the uh, executive director of and co-founder of. We are also the anchor organization of the Racial Justice Reform Coalition. Um, that coalition was the coalition that put forward uh, last year what became Act uh, 54, uh, Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory uh, Panel. Uh, and also put forward this year uh, Act uh, or, or S-281, rather, uh, which is a uh, systemic racism uh, mitigation uh, panel or, or commission, rather, as well as uh, H-862, which is the same. And Justice for All, uh, who I speak for today, uh, we uh, stand strongly uh, against uh, any uh, proposition for a construction of you know, any type of uh, new prison, particularly at, at the size uh, of, of, of this facility, I believe it's uh, somewhere around 925 beds. I think it's just a, it's just a bad idea. It's, it's just bad policy. Um, as you know, um, criminal, the criminal justice system and uh, the whole um, mass incarceration of, uh, uh, or disparate mass incarceration of African Americans, they, they've been inextricably bound, sadly, uh, for forever. Uh, so there, there's a lot of emotion and there's also a lot of concern uh, from uh, people of color and communities, uh, those are our, who are from our migrant communities, those who are uh, people of color throughout the state as well with, with the proposition. <clears throat> now let me just say that the, um, the whole idea of, of constructing a prison, you know, to put that out in front of the idea that we, we may just have too many people incarcerated is just ridiculous. Understanding that there's probably somewhere in the area of our 
three and maybe even up to 450 folk in prison today uh, who are uh, serving pretrial time. And what that means is they haven't even seen a judge. And in Vermont, that's particularly troubling because we don't have local jails. And what that means is that these people go directly to prison. And what our Constitution says, criminalizing or constitutionalizing the slavery of criminals in our state, it says that they are slaves. So I think a lot of, a lot of what we need to be looking at is, is yes, yeah, some, some, um, some criminal justice reform, but also some racial justice reform. I think we need to be taking a strong look at you know, how we might go about, uh, in, since next year's 2019 also, how do we go about amending the Constitution to make sure that, cons that constitutionally sl slavery is prohibited once and for all in the state of Vermont as well. And finally, I think on the back end of the system, you know, it's important to understand that we've got folks who just can't get a place to live, right, by, as defined by the, um, the criteria established by the Department of Corrections. So we're looking at upwards of 150, maybe even a couple hundred folks, to, who the only reason why they're incarcerated in prison today is because the D Department of Corrections says that the place that they found to live is not suitable, and that's just not acceptable. So to build a 950 prison, um, 950 bed prison uh, to solve this problem just doesn't make any sense. We think it's nonsense all the way around, uh, particularly in light uh, of the fact that we have better solutions. Uh, again, um, racial disparities in the criminal justice system are inextricably bound to uh, this mass incarceration issue we have as a nation. Uh, we're offended at the proposition uh, that it would even be um, brought to, uh, out as a, a possible solution and um, we stand firmly behind an alternative solution that's being put forward by this group. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashley Sawyer. I'm an advocate for social and criminal justice reform, and I am formerly an incarcerated woman in the state of Vermont. I served time in the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility uh, for uh, several misdemeanors and two felonies, all property fraud crime. Um, basically, my response to the prison plan is that it is very out of proportion. So the female population, while Chittenden does need repair and it does need better services, that's the point. The female population, almost 80% of them go into corrections with trauma-based issues and mental health disorders. Uh, the corrections and being incarcerated further exacerbates those conditions for women, and there is no treatment provided. We do not have access to even some of the small amounts of treatment provided to our male counterparts. Um, so basically, women are being sent to prison in growing numbers exponentially in this state, and we are then not being treated for mental health, addiction, or any other underlying issues. The programming at Chittenden has been cut, so work programs have been cut, and reentry programs have been cut for women. So this plan presents several problems, but it also presents solutions. We're asking the questions. Why do we need to build a 925-bed prison when numbers have been trending down? However, there are systematic problems in the correction facilities themselves and how the Department of Corrections is, is treating them and handling these problems. So we support an alternative approach for incarcerating more people and also for providing them with community-based treatment resolutions, which has been proven and research has been done and data collected, provide better outcomes and lowers recidivism rates. Thank you. <coughs> That probably will still pick up, hanging in there like that, I suspect. I'm Ed Paquin, and I'm the Director of Disability Rights Vermont. Um, we have been uh, working for years with inmates and prisoners um, who have, to a large part, we have been working with inmates who have uh, uh, serious mental health issues. Um, we will absolutely acknowledge that there are problems inside and outside the prisons, but what we are looking at here is a massive proposal that turns us back away from a system 
that's modeled on the idea of keeping people close to communities, the communities to which they will return in all but a very few cases. And so that's, that's a fundamental problem. We have, we see in this proposal a large institutional solution for a state that has successfully, to a large part, treated folks in the community. There is nothing in this that addresses what we are not doing in the community. And so you'll see in the questions we ask and in the proposals that we make that we look at the community situation as well as looking at what is available for mental health treatment within the prisons, as was just pointed out. Um, as one of the things I think that I, is worth pointing out here, if you look at our proposal, most of the second page of the proposal comes directly out of current statute. And it, more than envisions, it laid out the vision for our system some 30 years ago, and that was to have regional capacity so that prisoners would be going in, staying relatively close to their families, relatively close to their uh, communities where they are going to eventually return, and uh, giving them the kinds of support that they will need to successfully return. There's a, there's a requirement in there that thir within 30 days of sentencing, plans for reintegration begin. And I can tell you from our experience, that is not a central feature of our system today. Our system is so crowded that we move them from one location to another, out of state, then back in state, then to a facility where they'll do some programming before they're finally released. Well, that should be part, it, that should be built into the front end of the system. And um, in the interest of time, I won't go into the needs, the mental health needs, um, which have just been alluded to. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Turning back the clock to an institutional system that costs tens of thousands of dollars, I think the number was something like $75,000 uh, annually for a person in the women's prison, uh, would buy a lot of services in the community that could be preventive of incarceration in the, in the first place. So I am Trisha Long. I'm a clinical mental health counselor. I've been doing that work for 30 years. I'm also the adoptive mom of two kids, now grown. Both of my kids experience significant trauma early in life, and they have disabilities, and they are people of color. So what we're talking about today is very close to my own heart. I also am the director for Resilience Beyond Incarceration. I've been doing that for the past 10 years. We are an organization that supports children and families who are impacted by parents spending time in prison. This is a phenomenally successful program, and I know that because we've been collecting data for the past 10 years, and we have successful outcomes. Only, well, 94% of our participants avoid criminal justice involvement. So 6% of our people are staying out of jail, and 80% of our kids are graduating from high school. The parents in our program have very low recidivism rates, and they all are showing significant gains in things like economic stability and employment, mental health, recovery, and sobriety. So our data demonstrates these successes, but I also see it on the faces of the children that we work with and the faces of their parents and grandparents and their caregivers. This alone would be enough, but successful healing and rehab also saves all of us money. And that's a vitally important consideration, especially today. It costs about $200 a day for a mom or a dad to be in prison. Our program costs $6 a day for our participants. That's about $2,400 a year and we work with our families for about a year, maybe 18 months. We believe children should not be made to suffer because of their parents' crimes. And we also believe very firmly 
that nearly all parents want the best for their children. And with rehab, treatment, and support, these parents can heal and change and develop the skills they need. With appropriate intervention today, we prevent tomorrow's tragedies. Too often, the debates about incarceration leave out the stories of the children and their families. And these are stories of loss, tremendous loss for all of us, including our communities. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention study population health and attributable risks. The CDC epidemiologists report that 61% of the entire incarcerated population in our country is attributable to ACEs. ACEs are adverse childhood experiences, things like toxic stress, poverty, and trauma. Trauma isn't new. It's as old as time itself. But what is new is the knowledge that we now have about how trauma shapes the brain and what we can do to heal it. And the way that trauma shapes the brain does lead to the types of social problems, health and mental health problems, and incarceration that we're talking about. A huge prison complex isn't part of the solution for reducing ACEs and trauma. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. If we were to reimagine justice, what might we see? We'd stop criminalizing mental illness and addiction. We would not build a huge new prison complex. We would invest instead in treatment, education, and affordable housing. We would reduce trauma. We would revise policies on bail, probation, and parole. We would not be compromising public safety We'd consider modifying the criminal code and the sentencing guidelines, so we would be incarcerating only the people that really need to be in prison. And fewer kids then would experience the trauma of losing their parents to prison. How many kids are we talking about in Vermont? 6,000 a year. That's 2,000 on any given day. One in 17. 6,000, that's the same as the number of babies born in Vermont. These kids experience trauma and adversity at a much higher rate than kids whose parents aren't in prison. These kids, our invisible orphans of justice, are three times more likely to suffer serious physical and mental health problems, to suffer learning disabilities and school failure, to eventually drop out, become engaged with delinquency, and eventually end up in prison themselves. The faces of these stories are haunting. They stay with you. Desperation, fear, confusion, rage, hopelessness. But there is hope. There are ways of working with this population. We can change things. We will shift this trajectory for the better, but it won't be by building a brand new prison complex. In closing, I just want to share a memory of a child and his mother who I met many years ago. When I first met five-year-old Zach, we were walking by the river next to his house, and he told me he wanted to slip away under the river and never come back. Five years old. His dad was in prison. His mom was opiate addicted, selling her body for drugs. And he was very often left to care for his two younger siblings. At one point in our journey together with his mother, she came to the recognition and was ready to go to treatment in Brattleboro. I drove her down there very late one night and left her at the door. When she said goodbye, she pressed into my hand a small charm. And on the charm it said, be the change we wish to see in the world, Gandhi's quote. And I said, okay, I'm gonna hang on to this until someday you ring me back and you tell me you're in, you're in a good place and then I'm gonna give it back to you. She said, yeah, you keep that for me because I'm gonna ring you someday. And just recently I did get a call from her. She said, hey, I'm doing really well. I've got an apartment, I've got a job, I'm taking classes. She found her way through it and I said, all right, I wanna meet you and I'm gonna give you back that charm. And she said, no, no. I want you to keep it and pass it on to somebody else who needs it. I think we all need it. I think together 
we can be the change we wish to see in the world. I don't think it will come with building a huge prison complex, but I do think it will come if we together address the questions that need to be asked. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Are there any questions? Can you sum it up, Patrick? Uh, the governor would say, look, I just wrote a report that the legislature asked me to provide. We can scale this back. It could be done in different configurations. What's your response to that? Well, my, my response is that the, the report does not pay anywhere near enough attention to what everybody up here has been talking about, which is prevention and rehabilitation, housing, jobs, the things that prevent reincarceration, and in many cases prevent it in the first place. The report is not focused on that. The report is focused on facilities, and that's the wrong message. And I actually think that some of our leaders don't really appreciate and understand that Vermont, for years, decades, has had a philosophy of trying to keep people in the community, trying to do things in the community as much as absolutely possible. We are getting away from that. And as Ed Baquin mentioned, if you go to the statute that defines uh, corrections, in the very first paragraph, that's what it's talking about. It, we've gotten so far away from uh, our original policies. That's the point, is we need to go back and, and go over all our policies on incarceration and corrections again. And let's make sure Vermont knows where it's headed in the next decade, not more facilities. So you fix the ones we have. We do need to fix the ones we have. That's generally admitted. There needs to be work on, on the prison facilities, as I said earlier. Uh, there's general uh, consensus that the uh, adolescent facility needs to be repaired. We do need, I believe, and, and uh, I was the commissioner of mental health after Irene, and so I had a lot to do with designing the mental health system that we had then. I, I will say publicly now, I think one of our the uh, uh, shortcomings in that plan was we didn't deal with the forensic issue in uh, in uh, mental health, and so I think we do need to do some of those things. So let's let's be a little more subtle in our approach. Let's do the things we need to do around the buildings, but let's really focus on what we can do to incarcerate fewer people and get more people out. Any other questions? And if not, thank you all very much. <laughs>